I'm Grim. I'm Zolgar. That's Kaiju. And this is Two Idiots and a Dog, Idiots on Film. Where we explore movies that we love. Or think are important for pop culture. Alright, so this week we are talking about actually a brand new, well not quite brand new movie at this point, but a uh, brand new one we're recording, The Matrix Resurrections. So we chose Matrix Resurrections at the cost of rearranging our entire season one lineup because first of all it is exceedingly culturally relevant right now and we wanted to fit that into our first season we did want something that was more recent and relevant yeah because otherwise our newest is into the spider-verse i believe so and we also wanted to fit it into the lineup because honestly it's just that good it is a fantastic long-awaited sequel it has a lot of depth to it i described it as a really dense tiramisu there are multiple layers going on here it's got great action it's got great drama it's got great character moments it's got a meta narrative that i think is incredibly relevant to social culture in general right now and honestly it's a great excuse to go back to one of my favorite franchises. That said, massive spoiler alerts. Just spoiler alerts all over the place. This whole thing is spoiler. If you have not seen Matrix Resurrections, I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm going to tell you right now. Stop listening right here. Go watch it and then come back. Please. You're doing yourself a disservice. Hopefully it's still streaming when this is airing. Guess we'll find out. But first... A quick word from our patrons. Like our logo? We do too. It was made for us by Tundra Katie Bean. You can find more of her work on her Patreon at patreon.com slash Tundra Katie Bean. That's patreon.com slash T-U-N-D-R-A-K-A-T-I-E-B-E-A-N. You can also find a link to that on our Patreon page and our SoundCloud page. So before we get into this, one more time. Uh, spoilers. Seriously, um, we, we are going to talk about major things that happen in this movie. We're going to give away a lot of details. So if you haven't seen it, preferably go see it before you listen to this. Or be aware that we are going to, we are going to be dropping a lot of big spoiler bombs one other side note, because of how long and dense this film is, be aware this episode may run longer than our normal episodes. We're going to try to stay on point and keep things on task, but there is still a lot we need to cover. So if you're used to our shorter episodes and this does end up being a longer one, uh, we do apologize, but we need to do this movie justice. Yeah, we already talked about this movie a long time, so... <laughs> yeah, we'll touch on that at the end. As, as, uh, how long we've talked about this movie today. One of the reasons that this movie keeps hitting is we have a strong nostalgia factor, and you see this all over right now in pop culture where we've got reboots, remakes, continuations, and here we have a rarity in that field, a genuine sequel 18 years in the making. It's not that rare anymore, though. Ghostbusters Afterlife as an actual sequel. I mean, there's the Star Wars sequel trilogy. There's... It's still far more common to find reboots and remakes. True. So, less rare these days, perhaps, but still rare compared to the majority of what we're seeing in media. Yeah. I mean, ten years ago, it was unheard of. But yeah. now we're, it's getting more to that point of rare, but it happens. I mean, we got a sequel to Twin Peaks. Crazy. I wish they'd lynch those donut eating freaks. <laughs> Sorry, weird owl reference. So we've got this nostalgia factor going in, and they knew it. They knew that was going to be one of their primary selling points, and the opening to this film does not disappoint in that regard. We've got an opening scrawl that is basically straight out of the first movie. New title, but it's the same opening... The, 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 the green code and the green lettering and we go through one of the letters and we, that's how we enter it. And we start off on more nostalgia where we've got this interesting 
not quite a retread because it's different, but we start off looking at a recounting of sorts of the opening of the original movie. Yeah, we start off with Trinity at the table with cops coming into the room. And we've got a lot of callbacks, which are going to be a theme throughout this movie, by the way. We're going to be talking about a lot of callbacks throughout this. We've got, you know, the, oh great, here they come as the agents roll up. But we immediately start noticing there's a few difference thing, differences. Uh, first of all, the cop addressing them is a completely different actor. And as they get out, one of the agents is noticeably very different. Yeah, we have... Um, the one who ends up getting, we end up learning is Agent Smith and is in the exact role that Agent Smith was, is a younger black man. And they do have some of the callback lines, no lieutenant, your men are already dead. But as we're watching this, we see two new, completely new characters, new, new, new characters that we have never met before in any capacity their their very existence isn't a callback to pre-existing characters. They are new for this movie uh, in Bugs and Seek. And they're talking about, you know, what they're watching and, and they're in something called a modal, which is a software loop designed to give a program time to organically and naturally grow, learn, and evolve. And this modal is a retelling of the opening of the first Matrix. And things go very different very quickly. So it's not just where we're treading the same ground, it's we're exploring that ground in order to set our movie up, but we're not staying there. Yeah, Trinity actually gets caught by agents and gets the crap beaten out of her. Which did not happen, and then uh, when one of the agents, Smith no less, notices Bugs, uh, she gets drawn into things, and we quickly learn that Bugs can hold her own, and that Bugs is a tank. She takes some rough hits off of the train. Yeah. And just keeps going. And as things progress, we end up where... It's Bugs and Smith talking alone in Thomas Anderson's old apartment. And they have this conversation, and we, it's revealed he's, he is Smith, but he's not Smith. He's also Morpheus, our new Morpheus. Not the old Morpheus in any way, shape, or form. This is a new character carrying on the name as a kind of a legacy thing. And we get this really cool sequence where they are exploring areas that we are familiar with having watched the movie. And but the with some really cool visuals. But the bottom line is they start us off with nostalgia, knowing nostalgia is going to be the name of the game, and then that nostalgia does pick up at several points throughout the movie where we get callbacks. Uh, there's a later sequence with Thomas Anderson, and he is Thomas Anderson during these scenes, to be clear where we're getting callbacks like having the steak dinner and he's doing some of the same gestures that Cypher made during his steak dinner meeting with Smith. We're, we're getting all sorts of callbacks with, you know, the, the medication he's taking is a blue pill. These are very deliberate, small things dotted throughout the movie to create these, these strong callbacks to the original and feed off of that nostalgia while still telling us a new story set in that universe. It's phenomenal. And part of what really sells it is these visuals. I, I mentioned them briefly before. There are these visuals where, like the, the opening chase sequence, they're running through and they're using doors like the keymaker used to use. But the doors are not necessarily aligned with the, where they're opening into perfectly. Like there's one where they open into a hallway and it's completely inverted. They have to do kind of this tuck and roll in order to make sure that they're landing on their feet. Because the ceiling is the floor in this new room. So as soon as they're through that door, their point of gravity shifts. So the, they're telling us right away, this is going to be a visual spectacle. We are going to be doing some of the old things, but we're also going to be doing a lot of new things. And I think that was 
the right way to open this. Well, I mean, I think that was kind of the whole point of this new Matrix movie is it being both old and new at the same time. Because there are, like you say, there are so many callbacks to it. You know, I mean, bullet time is a huge factor in this. Yeah. But it's used in a different way. In a, and in a very different way. That mm. That's kind of the whole thing. A lot of the special effects that they use and the, like, aesthetic choices, like the ground rippling is mm. a frequent thing. Even there's a visual effect of, like, when the helicopter crashes yeah. that is a direct callback to the helicopter crash in the original. Yeah, there's a lot of really amazing callbacks and and everything comes together and it's uh all nostalgia driven but it's visual callbacks it's dialogue callbacks character callbacks and this nostalgia comes together to really make this work so many little details especially in the visuals uh the visuals in this movie are amazing um i'll get to those in just a moment but there's one thing that this movie does and we're going to touch base on it more heavily in a later segment of this episode and that is meta commentary so much meta commentary so much meta commentary and one line of that meta commentary tells us that the people making this movie Lana Wachowski and the crew and the actors who made this movie knew what they were doing when they were capitalizing on that nostalgia in a line from Morpheus, uh, partway through the opening sequence where we're, we're trying to get Thomas Anderson to be Neo again. Nothing comforts like nostalgia. Specifically, nothing comforts anxiety like a little nostalgia. Wow! Just, whoo! That stings. Like, it's not necessarily aimed at any of us like that, but it still hits. Yeah. Hard. No punches pulled. And they really do, the visuals do really support that. And they serve that nostalgia in a very, very competent capacity. In addition to just some of the stylistic choices made, uh, we do have a lot of costuming and visual effects, as you mentioned, that are direct throwbacks. Make no mistake, the visuals in this film are breathtaking. They are. They are very well done. There's one that I mentioned, uh, I think, either in the notes section or just in a private conversation. Uh, an entire sequence I refer to as Dojo 2.0, where they're in the construct and talking. It's Morpheus and Neo. And Neo's kind of having some trouble because he just got pulled back out. Like, he's physically and mentally crashing. And Morpheus is like, I know exactly what will get you going and loads a dojo program and it's a callback to the first dojo sequence in the original movie between Neo and, and Morpheus but it's also different. This is an open air dojo on the middle of a lake surrounded by a gorgeous uh, autumnal forest and it is absolutely stunning. Yeah, it's one of those scenes that honestly the the lead into it the showing the you know the kind of zoom up to it isn't it's not relevant to the story but it is so um what's the word i, I think the the correct term here is the old school definition of awesome you just i when the first time i saw this the sequence i literally stared at the screen like oh Wow, that's so pretty. I want to go there, even though it's not real. And and then they blow it up. <laughs> Thanks, Neo. It's a construct. They can rebuild it. Yeah, I know, but it's just... Uh, we've got some visual design elements that are throwbacks and some that are new. A lot of the stuff we've got with the character we come to know as the analyst... There's new stylistic choices there, both visually and narratively. Uh, this they they figured out 
a better system of control, a softer yet firmer system of control, where they're working off of our emotion rather than our logic and facts. And there's a whole monologue about it that we're going to touch on later. But that means we've got this softer looking authority figure because in this instance the authority figure is presenting themselves as somebody who's there to help you not give you rules yeah he is presented as neo's therapist or i should say thomas anderson's therapist yeah and i we keep making that distinction for a reason because where we start with him he is definitely still thomas anderson again because they have built up this narrative around him where the matrix was a video game trilogy he made the st- and he's been struggling with mental health issues, having trouble discerning real from fiction. And that's their system of control. Total gaslighting. Yeah, they are completely gaslighting Thomas Anderson into believing that the events that he remembers of the original three Matrix movies were all in his head, and he used those to create a video game series called The Matrix. And we've got, as a result, we've got the world around him is a softer world. His office is very nice, a far cry from the stark, depressing, bleak cube farm we got in the first movie. Uh, the, the development firm he works at is very well funded. It, they are apparently a subsidiary of Warner Brothers, which comes up in a conversation we're going to touch on when we get to the dialogue and meta narrative and everything. And even uh, the coffee shop he goes to is a little more upscale. It's still consumer retail coffee shop, not like a mom and pop. Named, by the way, Simulate, which is just, I love it. So you've got all these elements of life that are softer, more approachable, more comfortable, but they also still carry that bleak day-to-day drudgery to them. And there's a sequence that I'm going to touch on here where he's going through the daily grind and the visuals in it are exactly what they need to be, where we feel, because of the visuals and the song choice, that we feel his depression. We feel him trapped in this loop, like a hamster in a wheel. And it's also a callback to its own movie because we saw in the prologue sequence, Morpheus describing that same trapped loop. It's really great. And we see a glimpse just a few glimpses that something's not right here. As a matter of fact, up until this point, the whole movie has been presented minus the prologue. If not for that prologue, we would be right there with Thomas Anderson wondering if this was, if the Matrix happened, or if it was all in his head. We got that prologue, this, which I think is really cool in that the story wants to gaslight Thomas Anderson, but it doesn't want to gaslight the audience. Yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting choice, and I think it's the right choice for this movie. Yeah, they very easily could have gone the other direction and been like, "Oh, it was all in its head all along," and it would not have been narratively satisfying, but it would have fit. What we got was much more narratively satisfying. We have a colorful new cast of characters who are amazing. We've got Bugs, who is the captain of the Nemesis. And she's amazing. We've got our new Morpheus, who it is straight up said was built as a amalgamation of influences on Neo, namely Smith and Morpheus. And while there's a little wiggling there, because that is, well, as Morpheus puts it, a little crazy making, it works. And he's got this very flamboyant style to him. He gives a few callbacks to old Morpheus, but he's not trying to be old Morpheus. Yeah, I mean, the the actor is not Lawrence Fishburne, but he's not trying to be Lawrence Fishburne. Uh, The first time he meets Neo face-to-face, excuse me, Thomas Anderson face-to-face, he even gives a line about, At last, 
And Neo's just, or excuse me, again, Thomas Anderson at this point is looking, just like, what? And he's like, oh, well, <laughs> wasn't sure about the callback, but couldn't resist. Again, this movie is meta upon meta upon meta. Um, we've got a new Smith. I believe you mentioned Hugo was originally on board. Yeah, Hugo Weaving was supposed to play Agent Smith, but Hugo Weaving right now is doing a lot of theater work. So, you know, stage productions and the scheduling of Matrix Resurrections conflicted with his current theater work, which is really unfortunate because as soon as he heard that they wanted him back, he was like, yes, I will do it. But, you know, like not even seeing the contract or the script or anything, just, oh, you want me to play Smith again? I'm in. Yeah, uh, that said, the new actor we got did an amazing job, and it is explained in the narrative why he's a new actor, to a satisfying point, I believe. Yeah. And our introduction to this new Smith is great. He's got a, a that modern business casual style going on where he's got like the, the nice plain shirt, the blazer, the nice pants, but he's not like over the top I'm super rich and dressing like it either yeah. it, it it's works it's in many ways and quite deliberately a <laughs> mirror of what we see Thomas Anderson wearing for the most part and the interesting part here <laughs> is the first line we get out of New Smith is an old Smith line yeah he's he's standing there at a window and Oh, what's Smith's line? Like, you know. Millions of people just living out their lives, oblivious. And then he turns and grins, like, You wrote that, right? That was great. That was great stuff. So they've added it as part of the narrative here. Well, and they also kind of do an implication right there that this is the new Smith, because as um, Thomas walks into his office and he says that line, we get a flash to the original Smith delivering that line. Yeah. And then we also get a, they double down on it in that same scene and conversation because they gives a line something to the effect of, you know, what did you think when we were, were first met? You thought our chemistry was like an FBI interrogation. And then we get another f flash cut to the FBI interrogation from the first movie where Neo's mouth went all creepy and, and sealed. And as the conversation is going, um, that gets echoed in, we see Smith's mouth do that for reasons that are explained in the narrative. But his style, his personality is a little more loose. And if you watch the original trilogy, it makes sense because you do see that progression happening with Smith slowly throughout all three movies. He starts off super stiff agent man. And then... In the sequel, he's like a little more relaxed, a little more loose because, you know, he's unplugged. And then in the final movie of the original trilogy, he's starting to really loosen up a little bit. He's laughing. He's making snarky comments and jokes. Well, part of that is, of course, the fact that in the, the third one, Smith started to copy himself over every single other yeah. program and person. So you realize there was also little bits of those, of those those other programs and people making their way into Smith. So Smith wasn't the same person anymore. Yeah, and now we've got a Smith who's very loose, very casual, and very snarky. He refers to Thomas Anderson as Tom. Even when he becomes Neo again, it's still Tom. Never calls him Neo. And it's a really... It's a great continuation of the character while also being a new take on the character because we have a new actor. We've got, of course, the analyst who is masterfully played by Neil Patrick Harris. I think this is MPH's best performance to date. There are many who could argue that with me, and that's fine. That's your opinion. This is just my opinion. I think it's, this is... It's definitely one of them. Uh, another one of his really good performances is the Series of Unfortunate Events series, but that is, of course, a different story. Completely different story, yeah. And he's got this... Even when we first meet him, something's off. We can tell something's off. 
something's weird, but it looks like he's genuinely trying to help Thomas Anderson cope with what's going on around him. You know the thing that I re- actually really just stood out to me the first time I saw him is like, there is something up with him. Yeah. His glasses. Those bright blue glasses. His entire outfit is muted grays for the most part. And then he's got these bright, vivid blue glasses. Which, with that, that to me was such a callback to the blue pill. A little bit. Not to mention, uh, I believe I mentioned this, but I'm not sure, but Thomas's medication is the blue pill. He takes them daily. Yeah. And there's just um, so many things that go into these designs... Uh, I could I could go on about these character designs all day, but what these character designs and characterizations feed into are the story beats where we've got, you know, we start off with that prologue and then we've got that short moment where like, is Thomas Anderson crazy or is Neo waking up? During which we get that, that depression sequence where finally he just stops taking the blue pills and he's clearly frazzing because they're forcing him to make a sequel he said he'd never make which gave us an amazing meta commentary on this conversation that we're fairly certain might've actually taken place between Lana and Lily Wachowski at some point. Yeah, basically. So like we said earlier, the, the setup is that Thomas has been working for a game company and made the matrix series as video games. And the first scene where he goes into Smith's office, it's, you know, they're, talking about how they need to make a a new sequel that their you know their parent company Warner Brothers is going to make a sequel with them or without them they can do that and yeah and you know smith says something to the effect of yeah they they can and you know if we don't play ball they're going to cancel our contract and yeah. it's like I say we're sitting here thinking that that had to be an actual conversation between the Wachowskis because it's so meta because both of them said they were done with the Matrix and Lily is still done with the Matrix. Lana found a story she wanted to tell with it and I'm really glad she did because I think this is her best work to date that I've seen at least. And the story continues as Thomas Anderson continues to wrestle with whether or not he's crazy. He meets the new Morpheus in a bathroom and is just like flabbergast because... This is a program he wrote, staring at him in more or less the flesh. And we get one of Keanu's best acted scenes in the movie, in my opinion, where he holds out the red pill and there's just this, oh, no, 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 we are not doing this. And just the expression on Keanu's face, his body language, the way he backs off. Uh, the whole thing, I think it's some of his best acted moments in this movie, but there are a lot of really good moments from both him and, and the rest of the cast. As things progress, you know, we do eventually meet, I think before this actually, we did meet Carrie Ann Moss reprising her role. Here she is known as Tiffany or Tiff. Yeah, and it was, it was in fact before the d- depression loop se- uh, sequence that we first meet her, I believe. And then it's, yeah, it's, it's before because uh, his friend Jude introduces them. And... Yeah, and, and the very end of that depression sequence is him finally just going, you know what, screw it, and walking up and actually talking to her and, and buying her a coffee and sitting down and having a real conversation. Now, it's important to note Tiffany has a husband and kids. So even though he's pining for who someone who may or may not be a stranger, he is respecting those boundaries. This is just a friendly conversation in a coffee shop, not I'm buying you a coffee so I can get with you, which is also, I think, a departure because there were a lot of movies that would have ha- straight up had him moving in, even though she's married. Yeah, there is a lot in this film that is very much... The respecting of her boundaries and her agency, of course, that that particular scene also has, I think, what is one of my absolute favorite lines in this in this movie, and that is when Tiffany is talking about having a family, and you know, saying she wanted a family, but and she exp- says, "How do you know if you want something yourself?" 
or if your upbringing programmed you to want it. And that line is... I Again, meta, stacked on meta, stacked on meta. Well, it, the, the whole, that, it's that whole thing of social and cultural expectations that... I mean, it's not something that I always sit there and wonder. It's like, you know, how much of this is real and how much of it is just based off what we're expected to do. Yeah, which again, some fits into the main franchise themes of reality versus unreality. What is truly real? And it is, it's not as heavily emphasized in this movie because by this point we've explored that already in like three movies, right? Yeah. But it's still referenced because it is a core part of the Matrix franchise. What is real? And I think it was a really cool take on what is real because it's not what is reality, it's are these emotions I'm feeling real? This movie deals with emotions a lot more than the first three films. And I think that is what makes it really work. And we've got all these mo movements back and forth, and then finally we get to the point where Morph or, or, uh, uh, Bugs actually grabs Neo and actually convinces him to come, come talk. And that's where we start getting our rapid walk by and we get our, our basically our walk and talk lore dump to get us up to date on what's been going on because it turns out it's been 60 years in universe since the last movie. And we learn that they're using uh, bots now that are skinned to look like normal people instead of agents just body jacking. And of course also the bots used to, the, the bots they're using are more than just agents, they're using bots in places where they might be reliant on normal human law enforcement, which of course does end up uh, alleviating one of the problems I had with the original, which was the, the the fact that in the original our heroes were killing people for the crime of not being awake, so not knowing exactly who they were working for. Yeah, and we mentioned this in the note session, they had to do that to survive, but your feelings on that are still valid. We brought that up in the original Matrix episode we did as well. You know, your thoughts on that are valid, my thoughts on that are equally valid, but while we disagree on that point a little bit, neither of us is truly wrong, and I think that's part of what makes the overall narrative work, but here it works even better because now we're using bots. The thing is, though, these bots are not just law enforcement. They're planted all over the place. We find out Jude is a bot handler, Tiffany's friend Kush, Tiffany's husband, Tiffany's husband Chad, possibly her kids. Possibly but... her kids. We don't know. And uh, the analyst is the one who straight up says, yeah, we decided uh, population saturation was way easier. And besides, Bot swarms are wicked fun. And we see quite a few bot swarms. We, we do see the bullet train they wind up on as they're trying to get away and, and retrieve Neo. A bot swarm activates and a good 80%, if not more, of the people on that train turn out to be bots and attack. I, I joke that there is nobody but uh, Neo and Trinity in this Matrix that is real. We know there are because we've seen them in pods and we, there's a few people who don't activate and turn into bots in later sequences. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a strong joke because when Swarm Modes activates, I almost think the Matrix shuffles the normal people away just naturally like it's built into the code because the only people we see in those spaces at that point become hostile bots. I mean, if not for the fact that they jumped the bullet train in Tokyo, the fact you could argue that the area that Neo and Trinity are in, or Tiff and Thomas, is a enclosed environment for them, where basically this city, that's actually very possible, possibly this city mm -hmm. has a much denser bot population because it's, con it's containing these two characters that are... It's entirely possible. Yeah, I hadn't put that together until literally just now. And the reason that might work is because of how important they are to the narrative. We find out that this new Matrix, while it has other people in it, sheeple in their pods, as the analyst calls them, the core system is built around two people, Neo and Trinity. 
And that's where we start finding out that, surprise, Neo isn't the one, because it was never one. The one was binary. The one is two. Trinity is the other half of that equation. And as they're going through the story, come up to this point where this is inferred because Tiffany's mentioned she has a dream, which ends up being foresight, much like what Neo developed in the sequel, original sequels. And the analyst all has this monologue talking about how the emotions between them are basically what fuels the core of this new matrix and produces the most productivity. And it's this whole monologue is a great meta narrative on social commentary and uh, society as we know it and culture as we know it, where he's talking about how the, the facts don't matter. What matters is fiction. What's true is what's in here. And he taps uh, Neo's head while he's talking because during the sequence, we get a really cool twist on an existing cinematic tool they used in the original franchise. Yeah, they they actually take bullet time, which in the original franchise, bullet time was just, hey, we're going to have this thing look really cool because everyone in bullet time was moving in bullet time. But in this, the analyst can activate bullet time, but exist outside of it himself. So he's walking around at normal speed while everything else is in super slow-mo. And it's, I mean, it's, it's a classic effect, but it's done really well. And it's a great callback to the bullet time of the originals. To mention he can also uh, rewind moments in time using this this new system feature, which I thought was really cool. It was very well done. It was a great build upon an existing cinematic tool. And of course, in the narrative now, bullet time exists because in the the narrative, the fictional narrative they built around Neo, bullet time is the term used for the video games. So now it's entered the canon lexicon in universe which i thought was really interesting stacking layers of meta it's meta all the way down the turtles are gone we have nothing but meta and we've got our story beats and things progress i'm gonna skip over a lot of this because while they're important to the story one you should still be watching it it's good and two we could talk about story beats all day uh, but ultimately what we end up doing is we're watching, you know, Thomas Anderson doing his depression, and then we're doing this, and then we're doing that, and then we're doing that, and then we're doing that, all building up the thing. By the way, the depression sequence is great because they picked the perfect soundtrack. Uh, that is Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit, most known for being in Sucker Punch, but an amazing sound, uh, song for that scene. Yeah, not to mention a... In and of itself, a throwback to the Alice in Wonderland themes, the themes I can talk from the original trilogy. And when we go through and we've got this sequence where we we see uh, we meet the new human city of Io. Oh wait, it's not a human city. And we learn that some of the machines, now referred to as synthians, have joined the humans in building a human machine society combining their various talents and skills and it's really cool because it's a really cool new branded message of coexistence with technology i think it was particularly poignant because a lot of dystopic sci-fi including the original trilogy is very technology bad as a narrative trope Whereas here we see the fruits of coexistence, literally where it turns out they're, they're growing fruit because of their alliance with these uh, synthians. Well, of course, also in Io, Niobe calls back that idea of the technology bad because that's part of what was the downfall of Zion is this idea that humans and machines could never coexist and 
you know the synthians oh well that's they're they're those aren't people they don't exist they it's still us versus them even though it's not yeah and and that brings us around to an earlier scene where bugs and neo are talking about what happened previously and how neo was kind of feeling like nothing mattered and she looks at him and she goes straight up says all of it mattered and immediately shows him by introducing him to her crew which consists of multiple human characters who are all great i would love to go into more detail on them but we'd be here all day and three sentient crewmen who are also awesome again love to go into detail but we'd be here all day and as he gets a little nervous he's like machines are on our side now and she looks at him and she goes that's what you changed what nobody ever believed could change the meaning of our side yeah and of course that that whole thing that is one of the things i really liked about this movie is so often these you know 10 20 year later sequels they do make it so that everything that happened in the originals doesn't matter and this one they kind of say oh the main character starts going oh well what i did didn't matter and instead of letting it go that way they're like yeah it did matter and they show us why the events of the for the original trilogy are still so relevant yeah and all of this culminates in us finally in the like last third or quarter of the movie we finally hit our thematic meta narrative and there are so many things we're leaving out because there's just too much. It's This is a two and a half hour long movie densely packed with characters and interplays and dynamics and themes. But the final part of the movie uh, kind of becomes a heist film because they're, they're like, we need to get Trinity out. We, we got to go get Trinity. But that planning involves what we i soon realized was the true meta narrative and that was everything came down to trinity's choice it was her choice her agency that mattered here and morpheus is like the only one who's really kind of questioning that at all with a line about you know we, we got all the way in here just to leave her and another old friend returning sati looks at him and goes it has to be her choice. And the final part of the movie is where we really realize that, again, it was never one, it was always two. As we get this final showdown in the coffee shop where you've got the analyst and all of his goons and Neo walks in and it's just like, I have to talk to her. Here's the deal. If she says she wants to stay, you win. I'm done. But if she wants to go, you've got to let us out of here. And she shows up, and they talk, and it's another very touching, poignant conversation. And it ends with her going, I can't be that person. It's too late. And in, in, a, in a change from how so many movies would go, Neo doesn't try to plead his case. He doesn't try to convince her otherwise. He doesn't try to bargain or anything. He just says, I understand. And knowing that that, that, that choice of hers means his death. Yeah. And he is willing to die because she is comfortable where she is. Then her her husband Chad is kind of trying to pull her out of the coffee shop because uh, their daughter broke, broke their arm. Yeah, daughter and, broke her arm, got hit by a car chasing after mom. Just kind of needle that little bit of extra guilt in there. Um, and he's like, "Oh, we gotta go! Come on, Tiffany, we gotta go! We gotta go, Tiffany!" And then everything kind of just goes to a still, and she looks at him and she goes, "No." hate that name stop calling me that my name is trinity and we and in that moment we get this crystallized amazing parallel to the original movie my name is neo and the analyst goes oh crap 
And of course, then he's like, well, you know, I couldn't let you go and activates bullet time. And we learn two things about Smith here. First, he can move through bullet time normally. Yeah, he is immune to bullet time, unlike literally everyone else in the coffee shop, even Neo, who has powers. And the fight devolves into pure chaos. There's some really cool visual and story moments here that I would love to get into detail on, but there's again, there's just so much to cover. And at the end of that fight, we learn... The final little fact about Smith, he can still body swap. And in that moment, we realized that there was a little hint throughout the entire sequence telling us that because unlike all the rest of his wardrobe for the rest of the movie, in that sequence, he's wearing the barista's clothes. And when he leaves, he leaves behind the barista. And which also was a great line from him when he comments to Neo you know, the di- the difference between us is that anybody could have been you and I could always be anyone. Yeah, and we get a, a chase sequence after that which has the bots, full bot swarm. Like, zombie apocalypse level bot swarm. Horrifying. And With, then it gets worse. <laughs> yeah, there are so many connotations to this scene because the bot swarm activates to the point where these what otherwise seem like perfectly normal people suddenly start activating and throwing themselves out of skyscraper windows to be human bombs yeah and while they're not human per se they're still human shaped making it a very unsettling scene now it is not gory what we see when they impact is the code scattering not gross gore but it's still viscerally unsettling to watch yeah and like the right way meaning it was it was presented correctly this was not a look at the cool visuals this was a oh this is a nightmare (sighs) and also i mean the, the connotations of the bot swarm to that degree it uh it poses so many questions that uh we don't have time to get into but, uh, yeah, I, I will just state one of those questions for the record because I think it's really devastating food for thought. Are the bots sentient programs or just dummy programs? We don't know, and the movie doesn't answer that question. And either way, the answer sucks. Oh, yeah. So we finish this chase scene on top of a roof, and they take out a helicopter, which uh, the explosion thereof is a great callback again to the helicopter explosion in the first movie. Trinity gets up in the debris, staggers, and sees the code for the first time in what is honestly a very beautiful moment. Where she's, cause, and she even remarks that it's beautiful because she can now see the code like Neo does. And in that moment, she gives, Carrie Ann Moss gives what I believe is the most powerful moment in the movie, at least for her character, where she gives this little speech directly to Neo. And Keanu raves about this scene in interviews, by the way. And I. I can't imagine being the actor across from her having that performance aimed at you, like, because it was strong enough just watching the scene as as it was filmed. Uh, Talking about how she remembers everything and how basically, I'm summarizing horribly here, but they, she can't go back. She won't let them take that away again. And then they hold hands and they jump off the roof. And there is this, this moment in that sequence that, I, you know, it could be a callback to the original when they're, it's like, oh, they, they, are they going to make the jump? But they obviously aren't going to reach the other rooftop. And there's just this moment where you're thinking this movie could end on that just tra- tragic beauty of both of them refusing to go back to being slaves and being and rather and dying instead but then they stop falling and neo looks up at trinity and says i'm not doing this are you doing this and then trinity flies what this film gave us was a balance to the final imbalanced equation of the matrix franchise neo and trinity's relationship now they are truly equal partners 
as it should have been from the start. The, marinara, the meta narrative kicks in in this final act as everything comes down to give Trinity the agency she deserves. Uh, in the final scene with the analyst, even his remarks about controlling women, healing like a b direct quote, by the way, don't come at me, and comments to, to Neo about can't you control her all serve to reinforce the fact that Trinity was viewed as subservient or secondary to Neo, definitely by the analyst and who he refers to as the suits, but also by Hollywood in general. And honestly, a lot of the fandom. That is no longer the case, as Neo and Trinity support each other on fully equal ground and lay that out in no uncertain terms in this final sequence. And, of course, this final sequence also gives us one other line that's just... It's a really powerful line, especially since, from what I understand, this movie was about loss, which is, you know, Neo and Trinity, they go to the analyst's house and... You know, they say, oh, yeah, we just came to thank you because you gave us something we thought we would never have again. What's that? A second chance. And as they say that, shades come on, and we are hit once again with the song Wake Up. This time covered by a group called Brass Against with a female vocalist, which really fits the tone and narrative of these final moments of the film, while still being a callback to the first movie's ending. And they fly off, literally into, fly off into the sunset, and it's great. And ultimately, this movie is a story about choice, as with the original Matrix. But it's also about recognizing the agency of female characters and addressing them as equals to the male characters. And honestly, I'm here for it. Yeah, I, like I say, I think it is the best movie in the Matrix franchise. I would not disagree with that at all. Though, you know what would be better? Here we go. All right. What would be better? A movie about cats. The Catrix isn't real. Yes, yes, it actually is. And uh, we'll put a link to that in the description of the video. Well, ultimately, we could sit here and talk about this movie for a lot longer. And um, actually, we did. Yeah, our note session for this movie was more than two hours long, and unlike normally, we stayed on track. So if you're interested in listening to that, listen to us kind of go even in more depth to about this, you can find that on Patreon. It is available to any of our supporters at $1 or more. So yeah, if you want to come listen to us ramble for two hours about this movie beyond the almost, well, as of before editing, almost an hour, uh, you're more than welcome to... If you're crazy. We don't use that word here. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening to Two Idiots and a Dog. If you like what we do, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash T-I-A-A-D media. That's T-I-A-A-D media, all one word. If you want to send kaiju fan mail or reach out to the idiots for anything, you can email us at T-I-A-A-D media at gmail.com. Again, that is T-I-A-A-D media at gmail.com. You can also join us on Discord. Links can be found on Patreon in our email signature and on our SoundCloud page. We would also like to give a special thank you to all of our patrons on Patreon. If you want to hear your name included here, you can support us at the Honorary Idiot tier on Patreon. 